All summer, I'm hosting the Watercolor Summer Challenge, and that means I get to try out some really great products as well as giving away some great prizes. So today I want to work with Watercolor Paint by Core. I've been given this set of six high chroma colors, and I love the idea of working with high chroma colors because I love bright colors. And I know that when you have bright colors, you can mix them to create some really great neutrals as well. So by having bright colors, you can also have some darker and deeper and richer uh, neutrals. It doesn't take a huge palette of different colors to be able to create some really great variations. So we're going to play with that a little bit today. And I think I'm going to work in a bit of a floral theme again. Now a little bit about Core Colors before I get started. Watercolor by Core is made by a company called Golden. You may have heard of their uh, different varieties of paint. They're very well known in the acrylic paint industry. And when they developed their Core Watercolors, what they, what they did was they formulated this binder called, they call Aquazol. And they're the only company who uses this binder. And the claims that they've given with the binder is that it's, uh, br it, your colors dry brighter, they're more vibrant, and, uh, and yet you, and you get the same amount of light fastness and uh, pigment quality that you would expect from other well-known watercolor brands. So the colors I have here are quinacridone gold, transparent pyrrole orange, cobalt teal, dioxazine purple, green gold, and quinacridone magenta. And if you follow me at all, you know that I already use some of these colors, and some of them I use from different brands, and some of them I actually have been using in the core watercolor. So I already know a little bit about these pigments just because I have used them previously, and I was actually able to use them when they were still testing their formulation that was given a... Uh, an assortment of colors to sample. So this isn't my first time using Core. Uh, I love the design of the of the tubes and the size of the tubes is pretty much standard with what you're going to get from watercolor. These are 11 milliliter tubes. Price-wise, what I've found is they're pretty comparable in price to to other brands as well. Now I've just moistened the pigments. I've squeezed them into my palette and let them dry so that I have pigment right at hand to use and that's my favorite way of using my watercolor pigment and I think we'll start with some of the quinacridone gold. Once it's moistened I can pick up a nice rich saturation of color as you can see and let's just make a nice big circle here. And one thing I like about the core colors is that when they're moistened they have a great big beautiful flow. You can see that yellow immediately starts to push out and spread and if I were to grab another color, say the quinacridone magenta, and touch it in, it has that very addictive whoosh quality that I really love in my paintings. Adding some water and letting it continue to flow. And this is rough paper, uh, Hanamula Leonardo rough and uh, so that roughness should give us some texture as well and add some more water and let things really move. Whenever you are looking to have your pigment fade away into a paler paler version, you put it down dark like this and then you bleed it out because you want that soft transition, always plan to add more water, more more ability for it to flow than you think you're going to need. Right here where the where the water meets the dry paper you'll see the pigment there's still a faint wash of pigment there and it creates an edge and so you'll have a crisp edge there unless you bleed it away even further and you might end up going right off the edge of the page if you want an absolutely smooth transition you need to give that pigment lots of room to flow outward from your painting. And so I'll often start with dry paper and it will end up getting very wet uh, before I get close to finishing just because I want to give everything a good boundary, uh, a, good a good amount of room to move and flow and bleed. And this is the cobalt teal and it's an absolutely gorgeous color. With the cobalt teal, as soon as it touches that yellow, we're going to start to see green. But if I keep my touch light, which is what I'm doing right now, I will, the colors won't mix perfectly and so you'll get this kind of interplay between the yellow and teal which is really quite beautiful. 
And so I'm often, I, I try to not stir my colors around once I've placed them on the paper. I place them and then I let them do their own thing. And I want some more of that magenta. Now I said we'd be thinking of florals and really as far as I've gotten with that is uh, this center which is kind of could be the middle of a flower. It's not just sure if it's a pink or a blue flower at this point. And uh, first layers are for being soft and fluid and letting letting things kind of happen naturally and then from there we can start to think about controlling what's happening on the paper and I like this beautiful little veins of color that are moving out as the pigment flows and this could be I'm gonna let that be adding a little bit of green gold into the center as well and just a splash Let's plate paint a leaf over on this side. Green gold is a very pale color. If you're using it as a green, you can see it's going to be much more on the yellow side. So this is where it might come in handy to mix some color. And really my only blue here is the cobalt teal. So I'm not gonna be able to get super dark with that. And it might be worthwhile if, you have, if you're purchasing the high chroma set from Core to add in a richer, a deeper blue, a more of a true blue so that you can have a little more versatility with your color mixing. If I were to add, I mean, violet's got blue in it, so if I were to add a bit of violet to that, I'm gonna get this very lovely kind of olive green, which is gonna be a great color for painting a kind of a neutral green, a green with a bit of shadow in it. So now I've got some greenery. I'm going to put some green over here too. And being aware that those core colors, the Aquazole binder is what creates that whoosh across the paper. Gives us that movement. And so if you're used to colors that kind of just sit there when you place them on the paper, you're going to need to plan to adapt your painting to to compensate for this new kind of movement, this unexpected movement that you're going to have to get used to. Um, I want to add some more of the pink and I'm going to put it up in this corner here. Colors that have this high dispersion where they, they flow and move across the paper, they're really colors that you don't have to always mix a lot on your palette which I think is really fun to realize that you can just place it on the paper and let it flow into the other colors that are on the page that's really pretty uh, and let it kind of do its own thing and that gives you so much beauty and some of that watercolor magic that I think most of us are showing up to our painting sessions hoping for getting that magic to happen and I think if I put a little bit of pure cobalt teal right in here, that's going to give me some, some interesting stuff to work with once I start to think about my second layer. So the other, only color I haven't used at this point is pyrrole orange. I have mixed the dioxazine purple with my green in order to get the green that I a bit of a murkier green which I really like and it's a little bit neutralized compared to the brighter yellows and pinks on the paper and it's a good idea I think to use kind of neutral versions of color not just always go straight from the palette with these very high chroma colors but to mix them to get those gorgeous neutrals and so by mixing um, I can mix my cobalt teal, let's just do an example here, uh, if I mix that with the transparent pyrrole orange that's going to give me a murky color. Actually that's a really interesting green I'm getting over here. Uh, let's mix it in a bit higher, higher intensity here and that gives me kind of, it's kind of a, a gray blue green which might have some 
have a lovely place in my painting because the cobalt teal is already in my painting adding a mixture that has the orange in it it's not like I'm adding this completely foreign color because it's got pieces of the teal and so I end up with a color that kind of fits in my painting because of the cobalt teal in it. So it's a good way to introduce a new color to your painting by mixing it with a color that's already there. And I think the last thing I want to do, I'm starting to get a lot of paint on this paper and I want to give it a chance to dry and be a little bit open-ended. I'm just going to spatter a little bit more pink on the page or magenta. The last thing I'm going to do is just add a little bit of texture into my painting with some cling wrap. And I want to do this in the foliage areas, so I'm going to just use a little cling wrap, push it to get some shapes that I think are nice. And uh, I think I need another piece for this corner. And then I leave the cling wrap on while it dries. And the neat thing about the cling wrap is unlike salt, which is another way of adding texture, you can kind of see what is going to happen. Because as soon as you put it down, the color gets pulled into the bits of cling wrap that are sticking to your paper. So I can already see the little lines that are I can already see the little lines that are happening there, and that's going to give me an indication of what the cling wrap is going to do in my painting. And I can change it now while everything's moist just by adjusting the wrinkles in my cling wrap. So I'm going to let that dry, and then we'll come back and uh, pull the cling wrap off and add some details. And I think this will be kind of a fun little abstract floral exercise. Just so removing the cling wrap after everything is thoroughly dried, you can see the beautiful little edges that are created by the texture of the cling wrap and the moisture of the pigment. So that's really beautiful and it's a good way to, I love using it to create foliage because you can then take this pattern and I don't want it to be this is the focal point of my painting. I want it to uh, just accent everything else that's happening in the painting. So the first thing I like to do is just put a glaze over top of that. So I'm going to grab some of the cobalt teal and a little bit of the purple to gray down my teal and you can see how it immediately gets toned down over here. And I'm just going to paint around, so negative painting, uh, paint around this flower shape here. Give myself a petal just by painting an edge there. And then I'm just going to add some water to soften that line I just painted. And as it flows over the area with the cling, where the, where the cling wrap created texture, I will tone down that cling wrap technique so that it's not the first thing your viewer sees. You don't want somebody to walk up to your painting and go, oh look, she used the cling wrap technique. You want the techniques to stand, uh, to support the painting, not to overcome, overtake the painting. So there we go, we'll just, and that just softens that. You can see how, so how much softer this area looks compared to this area over here where the texture hasn't been uh, layered with any glaze yet. And glazing in watercolor just means putting a thin veil of color over existing color. Uh, I don't clean my palette. I like to use the colors that are already in there for future paintings. You get some really beautiful neutrals when you do that. And uh, over here the pigment's quite concentrated. It does re-wet a little bit and move and you can expect that with watercolor. But most of the time we plan in our first layers to use thin glazes of pigment so that you can continue to layer without disturbing the pigments underneath. And some of that depends on the paper you're using. A really uh, slick kind of student quality paper it often has kind of that shinier surface and uh, so then you'll get pigment that moves even if you're using thin layers just because it hasn't been absorbed into the paper. Now this Hanamula uh, rough paper does absorb the pigment quite readily and so I can layer over top without worrying about the paint moving underneath. And I love seeing how vibrantly that magenta goes on. Just look at how, how beautiful that is. And I love that with core colors, I, kn I can have confidence that that vibrancy will remain after the pigment starts to dry and has dried on my paper.
Um, when you have a beautiful texture like this down here, it's very tempting not to want to put any color over top of it because you don't want to lose that beauty. But at the same time, being that watercolor is transparent, we can layer color and have confidence that what's underneath will show through. And sometimes you can take a wash from lovely to just really, really stunning by adding those beautiful depths of color. And uh, hopefully today will be one of those times. And when you're layering color, there's, you know, there's different options. You can tone down a color by layering the uh, complement to that color over top, or you can make the, give the color more depth by adding more of the same, uh, enriching the color with colors in the, in the same color family, or the same, or the, or the original color, and just adding successive layers to create depth. One thing I don't often do, and I should, is mix two similar colors, two colors in kind of the same color family. Here I have the transparent orange and the Quinn magenta, both warm colors and kind of the red side. And when I combine the two of them together, it's beautiful, rich, vibrant red. And uh, so I'm just liking touching that into my painting and letting it flow a little bit. One thing I've noticed with core colors and I'm not sure how far I'll go towards finishing this painting. Uh, I find with these loose and fluid paintings, you have to give your painting time to speak to you and let you know what you need, what it needs. But one thing I've noticed with Core before I move on is how it does these little fingers of color as it flows across the paper. And um, it's almost kind of spidery the way it sends out these little tendrils of pigment in a wet wash. And not all, I, I haven't noticed that with other brands of color. So that might be a characteristic of the Aquazole binder. Uh, it's just something that I'm aware of and and can add some beautiful effects or if I don't love those fingers in a particular place I can just kind of soften them away with my brush so that I have a little bit more smoothness in how the color flows. Um, I haven't done a lot in this area and that's because I'm not real certain what I want to do. Maybe I'll create some leaves off in the background and that's just softening a little bit here. This kind of has a little bit of a starburst effect which with the cobalt teal, so I might want to enhance that with a little negative painting, painting around maybe a white a white flower behind the pink flower. If I put some darks here, I think I should get this yellow center will pop even just a little bit more. And I want to splash a little color down with a flick of my brush. I can echo whatever color is happening here and move it down through the paper. I kind of like that little trail of violet that's happening there. Um, tapping with tapping my brush against my hand will cause it to spatter just a little bit better than just trying to wave it around. Using this wet on dry technique, starting with dry paper and adding color and building up shapes of color means that I have more control over positioning shapes in my painting. It's really beautiful to be able to create those shapes without seeing them just fade away into a wet wash and to have some edges and then some softness where it, the painting looks wet and wet but you have just a little bit more control this is really helpful to creating the, a scene with some structure and um, giving me the control that I that I crave uh, in watercolor and anybody who's you know, dropped color into a wet and wet wash and seen it all fade away into a kind of this one bland, very smooth effect knows exactly what I mean. Let's have some control and yet some beautiful wet and wet. I 
I'm noticing as well the green gold looks really gold in this painting. It's really beautiful uh, in the way it glows beside the other colors in the painting. One reason the cobalt teal stands out like this is that it is a little bit opaque so you can place it over darker colors and it will kind of pop just a little bit more. And I'm going to add some water and just wash some pigment down the page, thinning that glaze and yet giving it some organic uh, mixture there. Felt like having just this pink here was a little bit not was not really enough to give my flower some structure. So I added some shapes here, and it actually looks like the continuation of this big floral shape, which I think works really well. Dotting in a little bit of the pyrrole orange with some magenta mixed in. Seeing those fingers again of color. I was going to call them spider legs, but tendrils of color sounds a little bit more poetic. Not everyone admires sp spiders the way I do. So adding that little bit of magenta over there, touching in a little bit over here, just continues the echo of, or the pattern and rhythm in the painting. And I am always looking for ways to create rhythm and pattern to repeat things, the motifs across the painting. That gives you a stronger design than just having one shape all by itself on one side. And I want to do a few bold strokes before I set this aside to dry. And uh, those will really pop in the scene. And it just it'll again showcase the vibrancy of the core color. And again, look at those, look at those tendrils just spreading across the paper. These are high intensity colors, and so you get a lot of vibrancy when you let them play. And yet you can tone them down, mix them with their complements to create a more subdued neutral. I will be adding to this palette. I can see the need for uh, maybe a phthalo turquoise, a brighter a blue, and, uh, and also a purer yellow. The quinacridone gold is just a little bit too orangey to make a good, brilliant yellow. So some cadmium yellow might be, might be really helpful. And also the phthalo turquoise or phthalo blue. Something in that bright blue range will give me uh, the ability to mix some darker greens, which I really feel the need for in the painting at this stage. Uh, mixing a little bit of dioxazine purple with my green gold gives me a kind of a murky olive green, which I can use. Uh, and it'll be, being that it's kind of a neutral, it will be kind of subdued in the painting. Okay, I feel like I'm starting to paint kind of aimlessly. I'm also starting to lose my, my texture from my cling wrap by putting so much paint on. So I'm going to give this, give this a break and uh, see what it looks like when, it, when it's dried once again. After a couple of hours of drying, I get to come back and see the magic still occurring on my paper, which I think is always really special. And I was a little concerned that my cling wrap texture would have vanished, and it hasn't really. It's very much more subtle and incorporated into the painting. It's the kind of thing where you need to step a little closer to see. And I love that about watercolor. When a painting, it draws you in deeper. There's more to see uh, the closer you get to the painting. So at this stage, you know, we're thinking about finishing touches. And for me, that means detail and line. And 
in the process of watercolor painting, you know, we start with a very loose first layer, and then we gradually get a little, zoom in a little bit and start working in on detail areas. And so there's a time and a place for adding in those details, and we need to be patient in those early stages so that we don't rush to put in detail and then need to paint around those details in order to complete, you know, those basic foundational parts of our painting. So now as I start to think about adding detail, I can put in some darks, and right now I'm putting in darks around the center of the flower to kind of create some, some line and shadow where the petals might cluster more tightly together. And you can make some nice crisp darks and then uh, also add water to bleed some of that color out. And I never feel like I need to add all the details to every part of the painting. A lot of times you just want to add, you know, a few, a, a, just takes mi minimal changes, minimal additions to create that finished look in your painting. To give just enough information to uh, keep the viewer moving closer and wanting to see more. And um, there's that opacity from the cobalt teal again uh, standing out against these darker colors really nice and vivid and one reason I love painting loosely is for that very reason that as you create a loose painting and leave some details unspoken it gives your viewers something to look at and enjoy and and it gives them something to think about if you've painted every detail everything's spelled out for them you know what are they going what's going to engage them and connect them to the painting uh, make that painting memorable for them and uh, what, the other thing I love about a loose painting is that by leaving some elements unspoken or just suggested is a lot of times the viewers can put their own spin on the painting so you know rather than saying uh, this is this kind of flower in this kind of setting on this type, type time of day uh, they get to look at it and go, oh, that reminds me of my grandma's garden in, you know, in whatever region of the country they're from. You know, they get to add some information to the painting rather than me taking care of all of that for them. And it makes the connection just a little bit more personal. I'm creating some leaf edges here, which is just painting around those edges. I'm looking at the underpainting, at the marks made by the cling wrap, and using that as my guide for helping me to choose what my leaf shapes should be. Adding in some cool darks with my violet um, mixed with my cobalt teal, and that's really beautiful. Anytime you're working with dioxazine purple or, or Windsor violet or dioxazine violet, uh, there it's such a powerful color. You really need a light touch when you pick it up on your brush. Uh, it's really easy to pick up too much and then have it go on your paper almost black. So I've added detail in this area, I've added detail in this area. I want my viewer to move through the painting, so I'm going to add some detail in this area. So we can kind of follow uh, this detail up toward the center of the flower and then out the painting that way. And it doesn't mean that it has to all be the same color, but we need a little bit of something to balance out uh, the details elsewhere. So I'm going to create, I think, some more stems and buds or leaves and they'll they should contrast against what's already in behind the underpainting on this side of the painting and and I don't want them to be as dominant as the stuff going on over here because I don't want the viewer to just follow this line up the painting and out this corner and never come back again. So you leave it simple here and add a few darks that might pull them back down towards the center of the flower. 
And whenever I'm working on details, I'm thinking about how, uh, how, my, how an observer might navigate through the painting. What do they see first when they look at my painting? And then where does their eye go next? How do they travel through the painting? And when I see, and, and as I evaluate that, I can figure out where I need to add more detail or darker values. And that means pulling back and analyzing what I see. Uh, and how I experience the painting. And it can be a very time-consuming process. I don't do it all in one painting session. Okay, so I'm going to let this sit and dry. And I'm feeling pretty good about this little fun uh, demonstration and review of core colors. I want to just talk about the core watercolor paints for a moment. I love the vibrancy of core colors. I love that the pigments are come on, go on the paper very smoothly. We don't get little chunks and granules in our painting. They're very, uh, they just flow really nicely. One thing I do watch for because I don't always like it happening is in a wet wash you see the tendrils of color that fan out uh, in that fingery kind of way. Um, it only takes a moment with a damp brush to soften and smooth those if they're not what you're looking for in your painting. It does give you the opportunity for you to mix two colors and have those little fingers show the two colors separate and yet together which I think is really a fun thing. Core makes many many colors. You can buy them in sets where the colors have color selection has been pre-selected for you like this high intensity high chroma set and uh, or you can buy them individually and add them to your existing palette and uh, I definitely think they're worth a try. I've been using core colors actually for several years now uh, since they were first formulated and uh, I, I enjoy having these high chroma colors in my palette and mixing them with some of my more subdued colors and of course whenever you're using paint you can mix and match brands you don't have to feel just loyal to one brand uh, you know try a new color in a new brand and uh, see how you like it Core is one of the prize sponsors for my Watercolor Summer Challenge. If you're not signed up for the Watercolor Summer Challenge yet, what's stopping you? There's $800 worth of prizes in the grand prize giveaway, and there's additional weekly prizes for those who participate in the weekly challenges. Check it all out at watercolorsummerchallenge.com. And thank you to Core for giving me these paints to review and being uh, choosing to be a prize sponsor for the Watercolor